Hi, time for an M&S or music and sound intercom video. This is a model N440 and it was sent in to me by a fellow named Joshua who lives in Michigan because it went kablooey. Kablooey is a technical term, by the way. It describes all sorts of problems and damages that happen with electronics. I know at this point, there are at least two things that need to be repaired. There needs to be repair done on the power supply amplifier section of this board and the tactile switches on the button board need to be replaced also. Anything beyond that is unclear at the moment because it can't be plugged in and tested because of the damage on the power supply amplifier board. It has a dead short in it and overloads any transformer that you would attempt to power it with. It's untestable at the moment, so those are at least the two things that I know need to be fixed. Let's get on with it and see what we can do. This is the amplifier power supply board for the N440. The story, at least as far as I remember it, was everything was working fine. I believe it was during a storm or something like that and there was a loud pop and then there was burning smell and everything went bad from that point on. So what we have on here is, which you'll be able to clearly see on the back of the board, we have a huge burn spot right here and this dark trail that goes up this way. That's actually smoke residue. It's not actually burnt there and if we take a alcohol pad we can probably very carefully just clean that away or perhaps not yeah it'll come off we should be able to clean it up see one of the things i find interesting about this board in general is this intercom was made in 1989 in fact it's codated may 4th of 89 and you can see a production date stamped in red right by my finger this is a fairly old school style board for 1989. There's no silk screening or component designations on the top side of the board whatsoever. How boards like this are actually manufactured, it's not in my experience because how the heck do you know where everything goes? You know, do you have to count the holes and know? Or I'm sure it was done by machine, it was automated in some way, but to me it just seems lack of forethought in designing a board. Silk screening is not that hard to do and it's part of normal manufacturing, but especially by the time you get to 1989, it's not like it's 1972. That's one thing that I find interesting and possibly annoying. Uh, when you work on a board like this, like we have to remove some capacitors and things on here and replace them, there are some components that have polarity. Capacitors, most of them have polarity. Transistors have to go in the right way. Diodes have to face the right way. You have to get the anode and the cathode in properly. Without silk screening on the board, it's all up to you as the repair person to remember the orientation of how things go in, which means for me, what I usually do is I'm going to make marks on the board as I go along because you never know if you drift off for a second and you don't want to put a cap in backwards and you power it up and it goes sizzle, sizzle, pop, and then you got to fix it again. That's annoying and whatever. And then on this side, this is commonly what is referred to as a tin plate board. It's got copper traces that were etched off the fiberglass substrate and then the components were inserted and it went through a wave soldering machine and this is what you get. There's no solder mask. Solder mask is a coating. It's sort of like a plastic coating. It's not really plastic, but it kind of is. And that covers up the areas that you don't want solder on because you don't need solder on everything. Granted, sometimes some large power traces will have extra solder applied because it helps increase the current rating of the trace and all, but that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about normal manufacturing. By 1989, boards had solder masks. That's just kind of the way it was. It's kind of weird to see tin plate board at this point. Also, this has been repaired before. One of the three, it, well, several of the components that we're going to be replacing ha and one of them ones that have failed have been replaced at some time in the past. And I know that because one, for the compo those components are different brands than everything else on the board and I don't think they would have chosen different brands for just those four and the other thing is if you look right up here by my finger you see that's kind of dark black blob 
with green stuff around it. That's where one of the replacement components was uh, installed at some point, and they didn't do a very good job of cleaning the, the solder flux off the board, and the solder flux is starting to eat away at the solder and the copper underneath it, hence the green stuff. That's very bad. When you have a tin plate board like this, you have to be really, really careful because that's the kind of problem you have. If this was left like this for a long period of time, eventually it can eat away the copper trace and you have a broken trace on the board and then things begin to stop working. Down here where the explosion happened, that has to be cleaned up and then there are traces under there, I believe, that have burnt away and that's not good either. So they have to be repaired. So then this more close up view of the board, we're gonna be looking at this component right here. So we're gonna to have to zoom in as much as we can. That's as close as we can get. And what you might be able to notice is there's this capacitor right here. Watch for the screwdriver dancing around. And this one right here, and this one right here, and these are all the same value. These are all 470 microfarad at 50 volts. And you might notice that the height of this one is taller than the height of this one behind it. In fact, if I lay the screwdriver flat on the top of the second one and slide it towards the first one, it bumps into it and it won't go across the top because this one is substantially higher. It's probably two millimeters higher. And that's because if you look down here at the base right here where the screwdriver is pointing, we'll try to get some of these wires out of the way that might help. Right down here, it's exploded. That's where it went kablooey. And it's actually exploded to the point that it built up enough pressure that it pushed the aluminum can up off the base of the capacitor. While I'm not certain until I take it out, I believe that this has a dead short inside of it. The question is, why did that happen? Well, I don't know exactly, and sometimes it's hard to determine after the fact, but these three capacitors, one, two, and three, and one over there, which you can't, not this one, one over here that you can't see is not in the shot, this one. Those have all been replaced at some time in the past. Did they get replaced because they were bad? Probably. Was there a design problem with this board? I wouldn't think so. It's possible, but they had made this, I think the N440s came out around 1986 or 1987, so it was probably a couple years into the production. And if there was a design problem, by then they probably would have addressed it. It could just be that maybe those original capacitors had a problem. The original ones, probably same values. Uh, I have to look it up on the schematic, but they may have been a lower voltage rating. And sometimes they might have been running too close in the safe operating area for those particular parts. And they had a shorter life because of that. And that's why they were replaced. And perhaps the 50 volt ones were put in to increase the lifespan of the capacitors because that does make a difference. So the job I have right now is I have to remove this one. I have to repair the traces underneath. I am, I'll test this one for a short when I take it out. The other ones will get replaced along with other parts on the board. And then we'll see what we get. So I'll be back. I'm not gonna do this on camera because it's tedious and hard to show and takes too much time and it's a fairly rudimentary repair thing to do. So when I get this one done, I'll be back and then we'll look at the button board. Hi, I'm back. All right, so Joshua's amplifier power supply board has been repaired and rebuilt. I replaced the four 470 mic caps here, 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 and here with modern replacements. My idea that this board had been worked on previously may or may not be correct. This was the largest power reservoir cap on the board. It's 3300 at 50. This is a Nichicon cap, which is a good top of the line brand. This one is code dated as 42nd week of 1987. So it's at the end of 87, which works in with the time frame of that. This is the, another Nichicon cap that was in here. And this one is code dated 48th week of 87. So these two about the same. These four that I replaced, these are not Nichicon. These are a company called NIC Components. They seem to be a fairly large and reputable manufacturer, perhaps not one of the top tier ones in the world, but they're, they're there. They've been around for like 30 years. These are all code dated the 47th week of 1988, which places them a year after these two. All the little small ones that I replaced 
I don't know if they have, this is an NIC. A lot of the little ones are NIC ones also. The little ones, this is 42nd week of 88. So it could be that these actually were hanging around in their stock to manufacture because they only use one of each of these on each board and all of these were a more recent supply. That's sort of the way it seems to work out. So the idea that it's been worked on before may not be correct and I believe what's probably happened is these just simply failed. Well, are the one simply failed for certain? And yes, it is a dead short inside of it. I measured the other ones. The ESR, which is the series resistance inside each cap, is higher than it should be, but not so high that it would cause it to fail. Of course, this one's too far gone to know. It probably is just your typical age-related failure. Perhaps there was a power surge and that was enough to push it off the cliff, cliff and make it fail. What I did was I replaced these four first and repaired the burnt board underneath, which I'll show you. Then I hooked it up to the, to the power supply to make sure the dead short was gone, which it was. And then I replaced this one, this one, and a bunch of all the little ones, basically recap the entire board. Because when you work on something like this, you have to take into account the age of the unit. It's roughly 32 years old. So you're approaching the time frame when normal lifespan of capacitors is ending, and you've already got it here, you've already got it apart, you're already working on it, and it's only a few to change, so it's not a big deal. And that sort of restores it back for its age-related issues that you would have. On the back side, and I will zoom in so you can see, I repaired the burnt area. As you can see in this close-up view, this is the burn charred area that you saw originally with the burn trail that went up the board. I cleaned off as much of that as I could. This is your pretty standard consumer grade fiberglass circuit board material. It does have a pit that's been burned in it right here. It doesn't really need to be addressed. It's not an Apple One that everybody's worried about the authenticity and how clean and perfect it looks it's an intercom so you could repair the hole in the board but in reality for this type of application it doesn't really matter so what i did was i cleaned it off i cleaned off all of the burnt material i cleaned off all of the old flux one trace was burnt entirely which is the center one here it was actually burnt away in the center. I patched and stitched that back together. And then this upper one, the solder had degraded a lot from the heat. So I removed and cleaned the trace down nearly to the bare copper and then simply reflowed it and added a little reinforcement to the trace to build it up to make it stronger so it wouldn't crack because it does go over sort of the burnt area right here. So it's like a bridge across the burnt gap and you don't want that to fall apart. And then the third trace down here came down off the end of this diode and it came down this way and there would have been a pad here and that's where the burnt hole is. It's not practical to spend the time to try to repair the board, marry in a new trace, put a pad. You just don't really need to do that in a case like this. So what I did was I cleaned it all up really well. I added and reinforced the trace down to the end where the pad had burnt away. I installed the new capacitor I bent the, this lead down this way so it lays against the trace and then soldered it so it's heavily reinforced. That's more of a structural thing than anything else. And then on this side, the other lead comes through the hole where the pad used to be and it's been bent to match the shape of the trace and then very carefully soldered in place. So the lead is nearly a half an inch long and it's soldered from where it exits the board here all the way up to this point. So it's heavily reinforced and that shouldn't be a problem. It was a pretty typical repair for this kind of board. This is one of those cases actually this not having solder mask on it actually pays off because I didn't have to scrape it away so I could do the repair. This is the button board assembly from the 440. As I explained in a previous video, which I will put one of those pop-up tags right up here so you can go see that, and you definitely should if you're interested in, doing, in learning about this. These are all little individual tactile switches that activate the different buttons that poke through the front of the faceplate. These are famous for failing. It's a common music and sound type problem I believe they began using these type of switches sometime in the mid 80s. Basically what happens is the switches collapse 
and it's as if they're all pushed down at the same time. You really need to, go need to see the other video that I made because I go over this in great detail, which I'm not really going to do here. These are all original all these four and then all the other rows. This one I've already replaced with a new style switch, but I wanted to show you what happens to the switches on these because these are all particularly bad. So I'm gonna to try to show you this the best I possibly can because these are really, really small. The white switch here is out of the original video that I made. This is a, a tactile switch out of a Musical Sound N350. The black one right here is the switch out of the N440. And they are somewhat different because these are white and these are black, but essentially they are the same. You really need to watch the other video if you wanna know the great details about this. But the idea behind this is the internal part of the switch collapses so it's as if they're being pushed down all the time. If you look really carefully on the white switch, I'm gonna to try to do this to keep my big fingers out of the way. If I push it with, my, with the end of the screwdriver, you can see that it moves and it's still moderately springy. The switches on that N350 were not bad, it seemed. They seemed to function pretty well. So this may be a unit that didn't get a lot of use or the switches just tended to last a lot longer. And I replaced them. It was as an educational test thing to see how well that would go. This is the one out of the N440, the black one. And if I hold it and push it, you can see it doesn't really move much at all. In fact, if I do it kind of sideways so maybe you can see if I hold it down with the screwdriver and I pull it out with the little needle nose pliers you can see that the stem it just kind of flops around it's already if it's already mostly pushed down and it doesn't really want to come back up so maybe we can do it this way if I hold it down and use the X-Acto knife to kind of dig into it just a little bit, you can see it move in and out with the X-Acto knife. Like that. So if I push it up or pull it up so it's out all the way like it is now, if I push it down, it goes down. It's kind of hard to do. Now it's out and now it's down, but it doesn't pop back out because the mechanism inside the switch has failed. So it's just flopping around inside there. And if you take this apart, which is gonna be hard to show, as I took it apart, one of them pulled apart. Inside, which maybe you can see, you can almost barely see it there. Inside, there you go, inside the body of the switch, there are two contacts. One's kind of crescent shaped and the other one's not. And when you push down the stem, this is gonna probably be impossible to see. The stem has a little round ring on it, which I think is probably some kind of conductive material. And it presses across the surface of the two contacts and that's what makes the closure. I'm not sure exactly the mechanism that they used to try to make it pop back up, but I think, and again, really hard to do, really hard to show because it's so small. That's not too bad. I think the center part of the stem was kind of a cone-shaped piece of the conductive material, sort of like an, a funnel-shaped piece. And I think it was probably flexible. So it was like a rubber funnel. So when you push down on it, it would deform, make the closure across the contacts in the body of the switch. And then as you took your finger off of it, the rubbery material would resume its original shape and make it pop back out. That's all not happening anymore. That's as close as I can describe it. It's difficult because it's also tiny. It's really hard to show. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna do like we did on the N350 video. We're gonna replace all of the original switches with all new tactile switches. And I'm not gonna show that again because I showed it in the other video. So go watch the other video if you really wanna know, know how this gets done. But that's the next job on Joshua's N440 is to replace all the switches. So 
I'll be back. More time has passed. It's been a while because it took a, quite a long time to change out all the buttons since there are five by five, which is 25 plus a reset button down here, which is 26. And here are all of the old switches that were replaced. Oh wait, you can't see that, can you? Wait a minute. Here they are. Here's all the old ones that were replaced. It wasn't more challenging than in the video that I did the N350, which again, there'll be a pop-up thing right here, which you should go watch if you wanna see how to do this. After I put in all of the new tactile switches, I modified the backs of the push button caps, the gold ones, like in the other video. So go watch it. And I've installed the first 10, and I just wanted to show you that before I put it all back together, which is the next step. All of these now click nicely, listen. See, ideal. So, and I did verify, I did a couple and verified it by putting the assembly back in the faceplate to make sure that there was enough clearance. One of the things you have to be aware of is on the button caps, there's this little step, this little ridge on each side of the long side of the buttons. It has, when you put them on the stem to the new switches, it has to be down from the back of the faceplate enough so when you push it down, it has room to pop back up. If it's right up against it, then it's not floppy enough and there's not enough clearance. So you have to be aware of that also. Although it worked out to be the same because the gold button caps on this model were the same as in the other video. Go watch the other video. Now I'm gonna put all the button caps back on. I'm gonna reassemble the whole thing. We're gonna power it up and see if it works or I don't know, maybe there'll be smoke, flames, running, screaming. Who knows what's gonna happen? We'll find out. The N440 has been reassembled. I've checked out all of the functions and features and everything seems to work correctly. It's reasonably quiet. There's not a lot of background hiss or hum from the amplifier. In fact, there's no hum, no real hiss that you can hear. And I thought I'd go over the controls briefly. A couple things I found out when I was putting it back together and doing the final testing. One, I talked about, I think earlier in the video, how you have to program in the range for the AM and the FM tuner. Apparently, that's not the case on the N440. It's the case on the 440, 443, and 448, which is the version before this one. This, so this one has a different kind of, as they say in the manual, computer board in it. And those ranges are already preset and they don't go away. One of the things I found interesting on this and also on the 440, which I'll do a video about later on, instead of using a standard rechargeable backup battery, which you would kind of expect, and that would usually be a nickel cadmium or a nickel metal hydride rechargeable battery pack, this uses a supercapacitor. And a supercapacitor is like sort of like a solid state battery in some ways. And that's a fairly advanced thing for this time period. So someone was forward thinking in about all of this. So I've had this powered up now for about an hour and it seems to be keeping accurate time and so forth as you would expect. So let's go over the controls briefly. Down here we have the master speaker volume, which is here. You have the intercom volume, which is for the volume of the voice part for communication on the system. You have system volume, which is the audio level for any kind of musical or other audio inputs. And then you have tone control here, which is simply treble to bass. And it seems to work reasonably well. You have your intercom control switches here that divide it up into two groups. You have door, listen and talk, and you have room, which is room to room, listen and talk and then your room control switches up here. Then you have the input, whoops, input, see the radio works. You have the input keypad here. Lots of buttons and, it, and I don't actually have an owner's manual for this and I looked around online and I couldn't find one so I'm gonna have to come up with one and I will put that on our website and that way, if you need one, you can download it and print it out. The buttons are, some of them are very intuitive and some of them are not. You have AM, FM, auxiliary, and tape, and those are your audio inputs. So if you wanna to listen to FM, you push FM. Off is off. You have AM, auxiliary, and tape. I know in this installation, he has the built-in cassette player that sits down below this, so he would use the tape button on that. For tuning, if we turn the radio on, and you press up, it scans up till the next strong station and stays there, stops and stays there. And if you scan down, it will scan back down the dial, so to speak, and there you go. 
one of the things I noticed was when it scans, like if you scan up, it will go up, 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 up to the top of the FM band, which is 108.8, and then it stops. It doesn't, it doesn't roll over to the lowest FM frequency and start again. So it scans up to the top of the scale or it scans down to the bottom of the scale and that's where it stops. So you have to manually tune it if you don't get anything more than that. And there is no actual manual like up and down, like push it, but you do have the direct access tuning, which makes up for the lack of the, up and, the manual tuning. So if we go FM, and we don't like this station, we can change it. We can do 96.5, enter. $5,000 in credit. And it switches. Five grand. That's right. So that's a pretty cool feature, especially because apparently they were making sets like this back in the early 80s that did that. And that was fairly advanced for in those days. You have the all important cancel button over here. And that's if you key something in wrong, you can press cancel and then it clears it and then you can go again. You have your numbers one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and zero down here. You have an auto on and auto off function. So you can program this to turn the, the audio or the music on at a specific time every day and then off at a later time. And if you want it to follow those preset times, you use the auto function button down here. You push it once and the red LED light comes on here and you push it again and it goes off. You have button to set the clock. When you set the clock, you can choose AM or AM is by default or PM if it's in the afternoon. The store button is to preset your radio presets into the individual numbered buttons. While it was a little tricky to figure out and the brochure for this, the sales brochure is a little on the vague side, I think you can you can either program in 9 a.m. and 9 f.m. or you can program in a combination of a.m. and f.m. up to nine stations. It's not really clear and honestly I didn't sit here and try to do all of that to find out. When you want to recall a station, you press recall and the state, the number that you put it in. Of course, I did that wrong. So we'll press cancel. We'll turn FM on and we'll recall a station and then off. So it's a lot of buttons. Now you have to remember, this is an 80s model and in the 80s, buttons were everything. It's not as intuitive as maybe a modern design. However, if you compare it to the last model that they made, which is the DMC series with their menus and things, this is far easier to deal with because you really can't screw up too bad because you can always bail out and use the cancel button. As for the intercom functions, I have it connected up to a single inside remote speaker. This is an eight inch speaker, has an eight inch speaker cone on the back. And I broke all the rules and committed the greatest sacrilege ever on a music and sound system. I wired it up with new tone wire because I don't have any music and sound wire. And honestly, I don't think I'll ever get any because in a short test setup like this, it doesn't matter. Anyway, on the remote stations, you have the same four intercom controls. You have door, listen and talk and rooms, listen and talk and I have it connected to this. I also have it connected to a single door station over there that I always use for testing. If we test the intercom, and yes, there probably will be feedback if we do door talk. And then door listen. We hold it down. We have that. And then we have room talk, more feedback. And room listen. That works normally. Same thing on the master station, door talk, door listen, inside or room talk, and room listen. It's hard to hold it and push the button at the same time. One of the things I noticed is when you do the switch between talk and listen, whether it's the door or the room, the listen comes in, there's like a beat and a half before it goes into listen mode. And I think that's just part of the way the circuitry is designed. So let's go ahead and shut it off. And I'm gonna flip it around so you can see, I'm gonna unplug it from the transformer. And I'm gonna disconnect the antenna from the terminal board. And I'm gonna carefully fold it down. 
We'll get to the back of the unit in a minute. So the way these are designed, this is the terminal board. This is, oh, it's upside down. It goes this way in the wall like that. But it's hard to see that way. So, and it's actually better to show you what, what I want to show you this way. In the wall, you have these, off the back of the master station, you have these five plug-in cables. The little one with four wires goes here. And then the white one corresponds with the white socket. And then you've got red, green, and blue. And these just simply unplug. So if you have to remove one of these, it's actually pretty simple because you open it up, you unplug the cables and you disconnect it from the transformer and it's ready to go. You just take it out of the wall. So that's pretty easy. Let me snake some of these wires out of the terminal board so I can show you up close. So it would sit in the wall like this and you have your door speaker connections are here. Your antenna connections are these four, depending on what kind of antenna you have. Then you have your small white plug, large white plug, red, green, and blue. Up here, you have these connections here, these terminal connections. You've got yellow, blue, black, and red. They give you two of each because if you have 12 stations, you can put six yellow wires and then another six yellow wires and blue and blue and so on and so on. And down here, you have what is essentially the green and white wires and actually says green and white. And that's where the music wires for your remote stations are connected. And the order that you connect them in is based on the order that you want your remote speakers to be on the room control switches on the front of the unit. Room control switch number one is this one, and number two is this one, and number three is this one, and so on and so on. I read in one place that said 12 was the maximum number of remote stations. I read in another place it said 15. So I'm not sure exactly what the actual maximum total is, but I have a feeling that if it's like most systems, you can double up a few of these. So this is a good design. Uh, this is a terminal. This didn't come with this set. This is, I actually bought this. It was, I found a seller on eBay that had one at a reasonable price because you need this if you're gonna work on these because you have to have something to plug the set into and hook up a remote station. Here on the reverse side, you can see there's this large aluminum plate here and then there's a diagram on it. In fact, let me do it this way so you can see it. It's basically a wiring diagram. It shows you how to hook up and where to hook up the wires that come into the terminal board, which is a nice touch. And you have your multi-wire cables that come out of the master station that plug into the sockets on the terminal board. And then you've got all your other boards. This plate is very important to have in place. It's held on with four screws because down here on the end, these are the two amplifier output transistors. These are large TO3 packages. They're attached to an aluminum bracket that's here on that circuit board. So this aluminum plate on the back acts as part of the heat sink for the output transistors. Without this in place, these get rather toasty. So you have to have this in place. It's okay to run it for a little bit without it because you're not driving a lot of speakers and you're just testing the master maybe with one remote. It'll be okay. But you certainly want to make sure that this plate gets put back in. Otherwise, your transistors aren't going to have a very long life. There isn't much else to show. I already showed working on the other boards. Probably the trickiest part of this whole project was dealing with all of the switches, the tactile switches for the keypad. There's a, there's 25 of them and there's also, oh, there's also a reset button. So right here, so here's the auto function on and off button. And if you go to the left right here, there's a little tiny, tiny hole in the panel. And it's so small that you almost can't see it, which is nicely done. Correspondingly on the switchboard assembly behind the hole is a reset switch. And that's also a tactile switch. It resets the microcomputer if it develops a flaw or an error or something like that that you can't recover any other way. You can insert something small. I think a, a push pin or not a push pin, but a straight pin or a sewing needle that's really small or something would fit in there nicely. When you do that, be careful. Don't scratch up the shiny black faceplate. Just be really cautious when you put it in. Dealing with these was somewhat of a challenge. Uh, they do all work because I've tested them. I had this out 
probably six or seven times to get everything situated correctly so all the buttons actually activate. And if you listen carefully, you might be able to hear They all go click click, just like they're supposed to. Oh, this one does too. That's a different kind of switch. It was a little tricky to deal with modifying the back of the button caps to make them fit on the stems of the new switches, but it went fairly well, especially considering that this is only the second time I've done this. I did it the one in the other video, which you really should watch if you're interested in how to do this, and there'll be a pop-up thing that in the earlier part of this video that you can look at. They turned out well. The the evenness of the button caps across all of these they're not all identically perfect so that's something to work on it's a little bit in the early stages of figuring this out but again as i said in the other video nobody's going to be peering at it really really hard because they're going to be happy that the buttons all work and they work well they probably work better than what the other ones were when they were brand new so all in all it was a very good repair it worked out well, yeah, not too difficult of a set to work on once you get it apart and you figure out where all the plug-in cables go that connect boards to boards and all those kind of things. But that's just part of the uphill learning curve whenever you work on anything new. The last thing I have to do is clean these switches, which will be easy enough to do, and then it's all done. So it was a good successful repair. I'm pretty sure that Joshua in Michigan will be happy to get it back and he should be good for the next, I don't know, 25 years probably, something like that. We'll see. Anyway, if you found this interesting and perhaps for someone it will be helpful, leave it a thumbs up on YouTube. Thumbs up because that helps us just a little bit. There'll be a banner right here that shows you how to subscribe. Go to our YouTube homepage, click on the bell. And when you click on the bell, click on it to receive all notifications. And every time we post a new video, you'll get a notification and you can watch it. That's all for today. See you on the next video.